there's an old cliche about introducing someone who needs no introduction. And actually, I suspect that Patty no longer needs an introduction, especially since I think I gave an overlong introduction <laughs> last time this group met. Uh, so all I can say is that you all know Patty. Uh, she's been participating, leading this project now for, for over a year. Uh, and it is a special pleasure and an unusual pleasure to introduce somebody <coughs> who brings to a, um, a talk for a bunch of scholars a rubber chicken and a book with a wrench on the cover. <laughs> and I think the best way to introduce Patty is to simply say that because that tells us much about her. The only other thing I will mention in terms of this project is that Patty, I believe, is still a member of Rotary, yes. uh, Boulder Rotary, uh, which tells you something about a different way of thinking about how a historian relates to the community. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, oh, thank you. That should be reversed because really with Jim up here, I just have such a vivid memory of late nights of sending this proposal, preliminary proposal back and forth, and to see you in this room and to be in your company is like, I, it's not like having a baby. I don't think it's like that exactly. It's not that. But just to go from that, that intense memory of that proposal and then to see all of these spectacular human beings gathered together, that's just, that makes me want to go write a proposal, really, and see if that can happen again. So thank you so much, because that was... Uh, is that an offer? <laughs> <laughs> if I can do it with you, Jim, it is. Because oh. what a teammate. What a teammate on that one. So yes, that would be good. Let's do that. OK. Um, my, right. I have no particular use for the chicken, but so many people had expressed warm feelings for the chicken that I, I just thought I would bring him. And he, he or she has, was just spectacular in class on Thursday because the chicken uh, had other functions, but I hate making a young person feel uncomfortable by calling on him or her to answer a question for reading she or he may not have done, and I didn't know what to do about it, and then I thought, well, I have the chicken. And so the chicken just flew around the room because hardly anybody had done the reading. So <laughs> you could say, um, and, and they were totally, they understood that if they said, I can't answer the question because I didn't do the reading. I couldn't possibly keep track of who was saying that, so that because you just throw the chicken as soon as possible, and so the chicken was just in high mobility mode. And then, um, but the chicken hit five students in the course of uh, ten minutes who really were ready to go, who really knew an answer. And I probably would never have noted those particular kids in that way. So I'm indebted to my team teacher here, the chicken who functions in great ways. Okay, so my talk is um, really two main points. Historians are gloriously positioned for civic engagement themselves and for the civic engagement of their students in the wider world. And historians are equally gloriously positioned for getting their students um, set for employability. And those are two entirely complementary and overlapping enterprises. Um, I have, over the last 25 years with my organization, the Center of the American West, based at the University of Colorado, and involving at least, at least I think we're at 85 faculty affiliates from every imaginable discipline doing Western American something, four or five of those historians, but uh, probably more biologists, I guess, than historians in that, that group, um, still based in history, as I'll say in a moment. Here, over the last 25 years with that organization, I have seen hundreds and taken part in hundreds of demonstrations of the two points I just made, employability and civic engagement from a base of history. So I could go on endlessly with this talk, but there is dinner, and there is also the most excellent, uh, one of the Mark Twain stories that always should be on every speaker's mind, that Mark Twain went to church in Hartford once, and he they were to hear a missionary who had been involved in mission activities in a very successful way, and Mark Twain didn't think he would be interested in that, as Olivia had, Libby had um, insisted that he go. And he enjoyed the speech very much, and after 10 minutes he thought, this is a wonderful man doing wonderful work. I did not think to bring money to give to this cause, but I shall have to, I, sh I have five dollars in my pocket, I could give that. And then the speaker went on another 10 minutes, and Mark Twain said, oh, this is so extraordinary. I really regret only having brought $5. I'll have to find a friend here and borrow some money. And then the speaker went on and on and on and on. And Mark Twain said that by the time the missionary finished, he was feeling so mean and nasty that he stole a quarter from the collection. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the lesson. OK, uh, at a Center of the American West gathering probably 20 years ago, I became exuberant, and there were faculty from many disciplines there, and I um, spoke with extremely excessive honesty. 
and I was supposed to just say, welcome to our gathering, we had a visiting speaker or something, but I said, I thought it seemed important and valuable to tell this group that, um, while they all did important work, that history was the queen of the disciplines, <laughs> I decided I would say. And I paid for probably two years. I mean, people just coming up and saying, oh yeah, you think that? Um, so that was a problem. And I have not said that publicly since then, but I'm saying it now. Um, okay, it might go up on the website. Okay, so biologists, hi biologists, hi geologists. Um, but there is an unmistakable fact that there is a history of everything under the sun. There is a history of geology, there is a history of biology, there is a history of, of nuclear power development, there is a history of natural gas dwelling. There is, there's no subject that is not under our custody. And I don't know, I guess you could say anthropology, sociology, maybe some of that, but I don't think uh, the this, this spectrum there, well, let's just say I think history provides the framework for bringing this madly diverse group of people from civil engineering through to linguistics and religious studies into a common enterprise. And that's just within the university. That's before we go outside the university, which we do a great deal of. So history seems to me to provide the framework that brings these disciplines into conversation with each other within the university and then permits us to have material to take out of the university and to engage in a conversation outside um, the boundaries of the university. So maybe another discipline could do it, and maybe I just haven't met that discipline yet. But it seems to me we have a great advantage there. Now I'm going to also, though, as I start off, mention the area that seems most unresolved for me about our powers and potential in the world. And it has come up in a number of moments here. Uh, and that is our engagement with values and ethics and what we can offer young people in that, that terrain. I'll, I'll explain in a few minutes why that came up um, in the bulk of the speech that I was preparing, but it came up a week and a half ago um, in a conversation. Six students and I had gone to see the movie Warm Bodies, which is a Romeo and Juliet plot in which Romeo is a zombie and Juliet is a <coughs> young human woman. And if you would like to, later in the, if there's time for question and answer, I will tell you why this was integral to my course in Western American <laughs> history, to go see more bodies. You'll get a clue with Romeo and Juliet thing, uh, but there's another reason why zombies were particularly important to the uh, curricular structure of my, my course there. So six students and I were chatting, we went out for um, coffee afterwards, and Ivan, who is, I believe, pushing 19 in age, uh, <laughs> Ivan spoke eloquently I, I asked them, having these great contacts, their focus group, I just said, tell me about your minds in this digital age. Tell me about what is going on for you cognitively. And I should have taken notes, I didn't, but it was great. And Ivan is, un is remarkably articulate. Um, and so he spoke and spoke and spoke about that, and they were all nodding and throwing in things. And so I became humbled by the hopelessness of my <laughs> being in any relationship to these kiddos because they can do all kinds of things that I cannot do in a digital world. And so a little bit, pitiably, I finally said, what am I supposed to do as your teacher? And Ivan was just out of the gate, and he said, help us with our values. We are at sea with our values. Well, Ivan, give me something easier than that. <laughs> but, um, the semester is young, <laughs> Ivan is in the course, so we'll see how that, that goes out. Um, and I hope somebody will ask me about why we were talking about zombies in the class, but I'm not going to say. Um, well, and Warm Bodies, I recommend it. If you, it's, it's, it's about zombies, but it's also just hilariously and wonderfully about teenagers. So those of us teaching freshmen, you need to see Warm Zombies. Okay. Um, now, for the big pitch that, I'll come back to the values and ethics thing, but civic engagement and history, our particular strengths in that area, no individual would ever think that getting amnesia was a good development. No individual with a closed head injury would say, Boy, life has improved since I lost my memory. Um, every day is fresh. Every day is new. It's just an exhilarating thing to be taking in information that I lose as soon as I get it. So that's not considered a good development for an individual. And in fact, you race to the neurologist if you have that. It's worse for a society. It's not good for individuals, and amnesia is worse for a society. And that is our great, well, one of many cards that we have to play, but probably our greatest card. However, I did want to go beyond um, what I had thought before, so 
I learned in reading an important periodical of note and influence, Parade Magazine, I came upon a book by a man named Bill Copeland called Ten Things Employers Want You to Learn in College, The Skills You Need to Succeed. So I saw him quoted in Parade Magazine, and I ordered that, and then read it scrupulously looking for um, connectivity to history and the discipline of history. Bill Copeland every once in a while notices that himself, and in, in two or three of the points that I'll make, the ten things you need to learn, he actually says history is the best place to go for X or Y. But in a number of cases, the poor, poor man, um, goodness, he sends students to, I don't know what, to communications classes or business or marketing classes. <laughs> oh, poor kiddos, they deserve better than that. And so we will write, I think we will be writing Mr. Copeland to say, to say get on the track here. There's a uh, one-stop shopping opportunity for these kids in the history class. They do not need to be cruising around quite at that level. But, um, but reading this book reinforced what I had suspected, which is that we are indeed in the catbird seat, uh, more than Bill Copeland realizes and maybe more than we realize for this matter of employability. So here are, I'm going to go through his 10 points sorted out by their ties to history. And I will start with the four points that he makes of his ten in which we are just at center stage. We could not have better, better positioning for this. Uh, I, well, the, first, the four points that seem to me just handed to us on a platter, and, or rather we have the platter and are handing it to, to students. So the, the four first, communicating verbally, spoken language. Well, you bet. He sends the poor students off to business psychology and speech classes. Find that. Okay. That's all right. That's fine. Uh, but he has to insert history into that point. That is just an incredible vacancy that he wouldn't have, have that. Because, in fact, the, the ways in which students can get stirred up by a historical example, a bi biography, a narrative, that gets them into speaking without having to go through that miserable, I shall now speak, I shall now speak. You can actually <laughs> speak because you had something you wanted to say versus you were told to prepare a speech for speech class. So the content aspects of that, I think, are just as important in the second point where we hook up directly, communicating in writing. I, for a time, uh, this person is retired, so I can tell the story, it'll be fine, it goes out in the web. I, sat, I had an office next to a woman who taught in the writing program, and the students would come in and speak to her about the writing projects, and they did not have content. They were to write a paper, and they would have really long, searching, wandering conversations with their teacher to find a topic that they might write about. Well, that is not our problem. <laughs> if anything, <laughs> abundance of topics is our problem, and it, having subject matter and content that engages you is such an advantage in any kind of writing project, because then you have something that you actually want to say. So here, uh, Mr. Mr. Copeland needs a little bit of help, because he, he sends the students off to writing courses, even a course on technical writing, news <laughs> writing, uh, social sciences, and so on, and he needs to put history in there. He, he does say that it's useful if you can find a class, maybe a political science class, where you're going to write about policy, speaking of civic engagement, uh, that would be helpful. He is not aware of, and well, how could he, because it's such kind of breaking news, that two uh, or more historians have written briefs that will be big players in the, in the uh, Supreme Court cases heard this next month on the Defense of Marriage Act. So Nancy Cott, George Chauncey have written briefs that are going right out there into that into that case. So poor Mr. Coupling is going to get a good long letter, but a helpful and positive letter. <laughs> and, that's, okay. um, and a well-written letter. <laughs> that's right. And well-spoken, too, if that happens to come on that. On that. Um, then there is uh, the third point that matches up directly, gathering information. And this is a kind of a dreary, well, that's the point, I guess. It, the chapter is drearier than it needs to be. Here are different sources. You may go to the library. You may go to the internet. Uh, but again, it's kind of, it's free of subject matter. It's sort of like saying to Captain Ahab, you should go to sea. <laughs> <laughs> what shall I look for when I'm at, at sea? Uh, the novel doesn't cohere at that point. It's just sort of Captain Ahab. Mr. Coughlin has told Captain Ahab to go to sea, but he doesn't know what he's looking for. He doesn't have a... So I think that that chapter actually would be made much more engaging if there were that sense of a target of the quest, a, a thing that is in your mind as you head up. But it's fine for listing the different ways you can get information, but gathering information there again, I think history does not appear there, but it should appear there. And then the fourth point, direct match, asking and answering the right questions. 
And remember, these are the things that uh, this man fills. He's talked to lots of employers. These are the things employers are most interested in seeing, and it's quite a match to other information we've heard today. So here he does refer explicitly to history as a place to go to get that training. The different interpretations historians offer, the connection between generalizations and what he calls detail, we might call evidence, he actually knows that history is the best, um, best suit there. His uh, particular goals about asking in, or practices and asking and answering the right questions to get information that will be as accurate and useful as possible. And then a most excellent phrase he uses, to learn to detect nonsense. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so these are, no wonder employers <coughs> want this the uh, capacity to, to build generalizations out of evidence, to detect nonsense, to make sure that information is accurate and as useful as possible, what sources to trust, he uses words that are indeed direct. So that's the one where Mr. Kaufman does not need anything but a letter of congratulation for how he recognized the importance of history in that particular one. And here's one, uh, the fifth point from him. I thought, oh, we've got that one. And then I thought, maybe we don't anymore. Um, a fifth Thing he says employers wants is the ability to use quantitative tools. And I started to think, oh yeah, right, my friend Gloria Main, great quantifier at C. Boulder, and my, um, lots of friends who, who were quantifying away in the 1970s, 1980s, I thought, they've all retired. I think all the, the what happened to the cleometricians? Are they still with us? Did we push them off? Or, are there any in the room? <laughs> <laughs> cleometricians? Yeah. And apart we incorporated them. Okay, well, so maybe so. Okay, so then we. I, I wasn't sure. I put this in the maybe category, but I know there was a phase. Morgan Kowser, I used to have. Uh, where have they gone? They're they fleeing my company. They knew I was not. I, I don't seem to see them anywhere near as much as I used to. But we should, if we have uh, drifted on that, that should be our asset, and we should put those people back in where we. Let's uh, make sure that we're attentive to that and reactivate it, because then we got five of his points. Uh, one, I think we will have to just yield and say, didn't work. Developing physical skills. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Okay, you don't know how funny it is yet. I'm chuckling over here by myself, and it's probably because Julia is laughing too much over there. So, but we're laughing really hard because one of them, which Julia could do well at, um, well, actually, one of them we seem to be doing pretty well, except, well, I wasn't so well out to weeks ago. Stay well, cultivate health, get enough sleep. One that I will be, um, well, okay, so then look good, dress well. <laughs> Come on, that's a story. <laughs> okay, well, so we just have to say, oh, sorry, can't help out so much there on that one. Uh, maybe not in a profession where we are equipped to give advice on dressing to impress or anything. <laughs> Although I said, even there, the history of clothing and fashion and how different societies have used clothing to convey messages of status, maybe we can't, we can guide others whether we practice it or not. So, okay, so that's. That was God. Uh, then uh, another one that I, and this gets us right back to Ivan. Um, another point that I thought, I think maybe, but maybe not, um, and this is his very first point in his list, students, employers want students to have learned how to take responsibility. And sure, yes, you bet, assignments do at particular times and assignments followed and so on, and we might well be in there, but he's really talking more and more in there about matters like time management in which I am students should be warned away from me in their time management, um, but also right and wrong, distinguishing right and wrong and making difficult choices and so on. And at first it just seemed to me that's probably when we have to forfeit. But then when he said that he advised students to take philosophy or religion courses to deal with that, I thought that's pretty, abs I think that's just abstract in the way that a historical case study just gives more of the difficulty in the context of that. So then, it wasn't until I was having a chat here with um, a couple of folks that I thought, actually, I saw that happen once. And I, it happened because I had a historical figure present, but there was actually really no need for him to be present. He could have been, as he is available on video. Uh, this was a number of years ago. The Challenger explosion occurred in 1986, and there were this was probably in the early 90s, I brought Roger Beaujolais, who was an engineer at Morton Thiokol, who stayed up all night, the night of the launch of the Challenger, uh, arguing with the NASA people and Morton Thiokol management not to launch. He was worried about the cold and the O-rings. And he 
I'd read a lot about him, and then I found out that we had a mutual friend, so I invited him to see you. The CU Dean of Engineering at that time, who's no longer the Dean, said that he that I could not have him come to the College of Engineering because they had NASA and Morton Thiokol grants. It's a little bit of an ethical learning moment right there. So uh, so Roger Beaujolais came to campus, and mostly he went to, to my American history classes. Well, it's fine. The students were all very shaped. They would, these kids had been young teenagers at the time of the Challenger ex explosion, so they were certainly very interested in that. Roger Beaujolais told the story about his effort to stick by the people, the astronauts, and to risk his job that night arguing, to stay in there and keep arguing about it. After the uh, explosion, he continued to speak out. He spoke to uh, Richard Feynman, who was on the, on the uh, commission looking into the episode. He was shunned in his town. He and his wife would walk into a restaurant and the, everyone in the restaurant would fall silent. They wouldn't fire him at Morton Thiokol, but they could keep people from speaking to him. Uh, he finally left that job. He said he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress from his troubles on that. So I got to see uh, 200 kids in the American History Survey class just leaning forward, just drawn to this man's story. And he went to three or four history classes in each case when the students could ask a question, the first or second or third question was, would you do it again? Mm -hmm. Knowing how fruitless it was and knowing that you paid a big price. And it seemed to me that the whole room full of students inhaled at once at that point and held their breath. And when he said, oh, yes, I would do it again, I would try harder. I would try harder. They, the exhalation of relief from them was something. And then they could not... Um, give him up. They, they, uh, a flood of them would come up after the class and just be in his company. He, uh, this is a ridiculous thing to note, but he was a, a kind of pudgy, bald guy. And he wasn't the kind of, wasn't Mick Jagger, but it was really so not the person <laughs> that you'd expect them to be so drawn by. But we couldn't get out of that room. We, the, the next class would be trying to come in, and I'd oh, okay, we have to get out of here, we have to get out. So I did get to see history, teaching, and ethical lesson without anyone being ponderous, without anyone having to say, no, boys and girls, Ivan, you'll notice. So, I, and I don't, it was wonderful to have him there personally, but he is, he just died last year, but he's left enough on public record that you can get, and on private record too, you can get Roger Beaujolais into your class. And just any equivalent to that, I think, actually responds to Ivan's Ivan's question. So I'm not yielding on the teach responsibility, taking responsibility and ethical things. So, and now I get to the last three items where I think we have um, a foot in the door, maybe a toe in the door, but every opportunity to just move through that door and claim this territory and seize it with a robust effort. Um, the, I will say that this next point. Um, I almost yielded when I saw it. I thought, okay, that's dressing well again. That's, we can't be doing that. But here it is, working directly with people. <laughs> <laughs> and my first thought, which I actually wrote in my book, which some, which probably not that, I just said, dead people, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Historians are great at working with the departed. And that's good, that's important, and they deserve respect, and they deserve that attention, and so good for us on that. Uh, but I wasn't sure that it would be persuasive to claim that territory, and maybe a little bit because we hear some stories here about departments and their workings and the difficulty of change of colleagues, and we have some of those stories ourselves we can, we can tell. So I thought, <coughs> forfeit, can't do that. But then I began thinking more about that. I thought, no, cannot forfeit that because in, well, in the world of our organization, say the American West, but many different situations, the people skills, that's really what this whole section is about. And he goes through the different forms of ways of treating people with respect and engaging them. And it's much of what people have said here about hearing different points of view and engaging with them and so on. We're kind of moving there. We're there in lots of ways. We wouldn't let... Um, I say this? We would never let the students in our class conduct themselves the way some of our 
departments conduct themselves in their discussions. So if our students started behaving like that, we'd say, no. The personal attacks, no. We don't do that here. So it's a, <laughs> never occurred to me. That's a little bit comical, isn't it? But, but it's good news. It's good news that we have customs that we can, um, we can apply in other places. So, so I ended up thinking that in ways I had not been fully attending to, speaking and writing are important delivery systems for historical perspective and civic engagement. People skills are a third and equal delivery system. So American society desperately needs historical perspective. Speaking, writing, and people skills. Those are three equal units of connectivity for that. And we owe it to our students to figure out how to be as good in the people skills mode as we are in the speaking and writing skills. So uh, the dimension that this, okay, so then there's a couple of others that are closely connected to that. So working directly with people. Another point he has, influencing people, which is to say persuading them, bringing them on board, figuring out who they are and, and aiming your comments so that it will not make them defensive, but bring them in. And then finally, solving problems. Um, here, again, he's not speaking as direct, he doesn't speak particularly about history in there, but he does say that a, a student should have opportunities to learn to be optimistic about change. To see, to grieve for a moment about something that's changed, or grieve for a week, but then to say, what should we do with that? And as he, as this is actually a really a great section on, in the book, to re, the goal in resolving problems is to reduce negative effects, not necessarily eliminate the problem. So resolving the problem, solving the problem doesn't mean taking that out of human experience, but dealing with it and reducing the negative impact. So I ended up thinking we are just about there with those three. For civic engagement purposes, we just need to say, this is what we're doing. Build that into the, into the, into the plans, which indeed in many cases they're already, already there, but they could be more asserted, I think. So. Um, my husband, who's a geologist and hydrologist, has been at academic gatherings of historians, and he has been, he called to my attention by looking puzzled and troubled when he heard the word, when a historian at a gathering that he'd gone to would say, we must problematize this thing. <laughs> my husband, the geologist and hydrologist, would say, don't we have enough problems? <laughs> Do we have to have a profession that goes around problematizing as if we had a shortage of problems and some profession had to be uh, kind of a widget factory for creating or well, problematizing? Now, I know that problematizing means raising questions about something too long taken for granted. I know that, that meaning. But it is a little bit symptomatic that we um, have an official language about problematizing and we do not have anywhere near the comparably forceful language about um, reducing those conflicts or dealing with them. And a very big theme that this man says that employers want is conflict resolution and mediation skills. Mm. And I have heard in this gathering, in private conversations, and, and John, I mean, John, you do it. Just say what you say, John. Say well, what you say that? when you say what, uh, what they have, what our students have in the way of conflict mediation, the, the uh, listening to disparate points of view. Well, they don't. They they sort of don't. They I mean, they listen, but then they just don't don't engage. They right. just sort of say, "Well, that's that's how you feel. This right. is how I feel. Whatever. Let's right. just sort of move on." So. Right. But they listen, which is more right. than is happening in Congress right now. Right. <laughs> so there's good point. And so and, and that's, that's just right. that's exactly what what I think is that yes, there's that bedrock, and if we move forward on that, and if we seize that and claim it and push to that next step, then um, a really wonderful set of opportunities opens up for us. So the parts are in place, I think, for those uh, people skills, direct work directly with people, influence people, and uh, solve problems. The parts are in place, but they're like a, a, the scattered pieces at this stage. It's a mosaic that hasn't been assembled yet, but having the pieces. So we're ready. Um, so, and then when Carol this uh, late morning was saying, Students have to engage with significant public questions. Well, that's where we are in a uh, moment that I'm going to shift in a second to, to what do we do now if we make that, if we accept that we have the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle here and we'll let the dressing to impress then go and then otherwise I think we have eight or nine of these points for <laughs> that. Um, so 
this book quotes a, a phrase I, I was saying I hadn't heard from H.L. Mencken on solving problems. For every complex problem, there is a simple solution that is elegant, easy to understand, and wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> that is one of our contributions, is that we really could not possibly put forward a simple solution. That's not the nature of our enterprise, and we, have, we know too much to do that, which is good, because the elegant, easy to understand, when, who needs that? So, so that, but how do we make that persuasively? How do we communicate these resources to a public audience in a persuasive way? And so now I shift to the stance that we could take to more effectively advocate our cause, make our case, and seize our opportunities for civic engagement for ourselves and also for our students. So, um, several things I would want to propose for that. The, the public stance that we take in civic engagement, and this is something that we have really worked hard on at the center, and I feel like I know a little bit about what I'm putting forward here, to every opportunity choose persuasiveness over defensiveness and prickliness. It seems understandable in every profession that is embattled or, or not respected sufficiently that the first instinctual thing is to say, you're not treating us right. We have a lot more than you're giving us credit for. Well, persuasiveness, not so good. My friend Randy Olson has made a film called Flock of Dodos about how evolutionary biologists communicate to the public. And he contrasts them with creationists who often have a far better public stance. He um, hired a couple of friends who did improvisational theater to stage a debate between a creationist and an evolutionary <laughs> biologist. And if you haven't seen this movie, it's really it's a wonderful, um, wonderful piece. So there's a pleasant, even-tempered creationist who's just responding, well, I'm glad you asked me that. And we're just trying to broaden the dialogue and so on. And then there's an enraged imperial evolutionary <laughs> biologist named Gerald Gurr. And he's very, very <laughs> distressed. So just one moment from that that I think is a good lesson for all of us. The, the debate um, moderator says, now, to the both men, uh, does your group have a slogan? And the uh, creationist says, oh, we do. Teach the conflict. Be open. Teach the conflict. And so then he says to the evolutionary biologist, does your group have a slogan? And well, we sure do. We sure do. We do indeed. And we do indeed. And then he takes off his jacket. And there's a, there's his whole front is text. It's, a, <laughs> it's all <laughs> densely printed. Here's our slogan, it says. <laughs> so that's. Um, a forfeit to do that. We don't need to do that. Um, and this brings me to, I don't know if this is going to be sensitive or not, but this man says, uh, in part of the working with people thing, is an influencing people, is that you need to make your peace with being a salesperson. Your students have to be ready to be salespersons. Uh, so, he's, remember, he's addressing students, but it seems like it's just as valuable to us. Get rid of negative thoughts about sales before you enter the workforce, because this, again, he's talking to students here. Yeah, I think he's just as effectively talking to us, get rid of negative thoughts about sales before you enter the workforce because those who make it to the top of every field are always good at selling themselves, their products, and their ideas. Now if that seems like um, an invitation to selling one's soul or something of that sort, then sell your soul, but do it to open the doors for our students. <laughs> that is a, if that's what we gain, <laughs> our souls have gone. Sell your soul. So, sell your soul, well, donate your soul, or take an IRS um, write-off, a tax deduction for your soul, or something. That would be so fun to report that to the IRS. So <laughs> charitable contribution <laughs> for 2012, my soul. Oh, okay, so, so there's uh, this, the, the stance, it's really, I guess really I'm saying, think of it as marketing and think of it in terms of how do you get consent and agreement and participation rather than by being defensive yourself, launch a spiral of defensiveness. Um, then a second one, which seems like it might be eccentric, but it certainly is and I think it's key, is a sense of humor. In chatting with people here, I know, um, for I think I could quantify it now, that everybody in the room has a healthy robust sense of humor. And that is of extreme utility in this cause of civic engagement. Deploy that on behalf of greater public engagement of history and of greater possibilities for your, for your students. In the Syrian American West, we just have found repeatedly that humor is the WD-40 of <laughs> public conflict. And it just, it, uh, people who were planning to be nothing but enraged and, and hostile lose their footing with that. 
humor. So that is really important. Okay, now I want to shift, um, so a stance, uh, the third thing I want to say is a stance of neutrality. But to do that, so the, uh, persuasiveness, humor, and neutrality, I, I need to shift over a little bit here to the Center of the American West and a couple of projects that we're doing doing there. The Center of the American West was founded um, more than 25 years ago. Its slogan is turning hindsight into foresight. So we have many disciplines involved, but that slogan tells you that it really does trade on and receive its support, both grants but also private donations because of the making history um, available to people outside the university. We have cultivated um, a stance of neutrality. We have had many conservative speakers at our events. We have had uh, everybody from former Secretary of the Interior James Watt, who came actually with Stuart Udall in a dialogue, which was a great place to be. We have brought um, actually a person I admire tremendously, who was the Deputy Secretary of the Interior under George W. Bush, Lynn Scarlett, who's working now mostly with environmental groups and is just an extraordinary thinker. So we have a, a good standing there. Mickey Edwards, the former congressman, Republican congressman from uh, Oklahoma, who's written a wonderful book called The People Versus the Parties about the uh, stalemate and his dismay over that. Uh, a leading Colorado uh, conservative who's, who was term limited out but writes very visible. He left a phone message on my answering tape a few months ago that I cannot erase because it's just the miracle of that kind of um, engagement of opposing voices. He was asking me to give a speech, and so this man, who I won't say his name, but he said, he's well known in that region as a very conservative person, he said, hi, Patty, this is so-and-so. Hey, I'm calling, you know, I'm, your, I'm the president of your fan club. I'm such a fan of what you do at the center. I wanted to have you give a talk. I thought, who's there? <laughs> so it's just such a, but it, it's, it is, and it's not because I've ever endorsed anything, but we have given him and others like him a place to be heard on a campus and to be in the company of young people. The, uh, the Rocky Mountain Legal Foundation, recommend State's Legal Foundation. Uh, the director of that, Perry Penley, it's a, it's a group that often sues the federal government for public lands management. So I'm, uh, he's spoken several times to my classes. The head of the Independence Institute, a libertarian group. Anyway, we have we have done everything we can to, to pursue that. Now we are in, uh, we have a collaboration with a bunch of natural scientists and engineers. And by the way, I would like to say there, let's not have a tug of war or a struggle with STEM. Let's co-opt STEM because scientists and engineers are lamb-like when it comes, into, comes to going to a public audience with their findings. They are, there's, Ivan Doig has a scene in uh, This House of Sky where they, where they have just sheared the sheep in midsummer thinking it's safe in Montana and then a terrible hailstorm, snowstorm comes in and the sheep are all just hairless, is that right? For, not furless, but they, they're just very <laughs> vulnerable sheep. And, that passage is what I see when I see some of the my scientists and engineering pals going out to the world to communicate about climate change or, well, just tell them our findings. And it's so touching and naive. And <laughs> uh, so they, they very, STEM very much needs us. And, and their students need us for historical context of their professions and what, what it means to be an engineer. I, a lot of the work of the Center of the American West came from my attending a meeting 25 years ago with with some scientists from uh, the Environmental Protection Agency who were going to Leadville, Colorado to try to help them with the leftover problems of mining. And the scientists, poor, poor scientists, could not figure out why Leadville citizens just wanted them out. And the whole relationship of federal... So that was my moment of thinking, oh my goodness, we must, we must help them in some ways with, with that. So, uh, so we have cultivated that relationship, and one result is that we are participants in a successful grant proposal to the National Science Foundation, $12 million grant. Um, it was called the Sustainability Research Network. There were 200 applications, 35 of them were invited to submit a, a more complete application. Six had, had uh, three-hour virtual interviews and two were funded, and our team was one of the funded ones. And by that point of the competition, the last round, the science has been signed off on, and it's really, what are you gonna do with your findings? So. Uh, my role was not trivial in that. So that is what we're doing now, is we're doing a, a five-year project on natural gas and fracking, which is the most contentious issue in the Rocky Mountain West and also much of New York and Pennsylvania, Marcellus Shale. 
and we are headed right in there. We have excellent scientists doing really good work on water quality, water quantity, public health, and so on. But we are the public communications and the and the people skills unit of that. So we start off, our speaker series starts February 26th. I will give the first speech in a, oh, I should say, I forgot to tell you this, uh, the Boulder County Commissioners had a meeting a month or two ago that was uh, disrupted and shut down by protesters. So now the County Commissioners cannot meet without a fair amount of security in the room. So here comes the center of the American West. <laughs> and our, uh, I will be giving the first talk, and it will be a historical talk. It will be placing natural gas uh, development and fracking in the big context of the history of Western extractive industry and the relationships of communities to extractive industry. One aspect of that is that people who've been going to all the public meetings and expressing extreme feelings will have to listen for a bit. They will probably know that they will have contempt for me, but they won't know just yet what the terms of that contempt will be. So they will actually have, it's a, the history card, people don't see that coming, and it's actually a very interesting way to get some more thought into the picture. At some point in that talk, I will have to say, make the obvious historical point, that the suburbs of Colorado that now so much resent natural gas development, 30 years ago, the expansion of the suburbs was cast as the big environmental problem. So what we now have presented to us as pastoral Edens of tranquility and Jeffersonian peace were 30, 35 years ago seen as the major environmental dilemma of the front range. So that will take some careful <laughs> speech to say. Um, and to get more to our point. So that is intense civic engagement. I'm sad to say that uh, some of the members, well, once or twice when I've been reviewed, the more conventional academics have said that I have taken, uh, I have given up serious scholarly work and I am now taking this lighter route of public engagement. <laughs> oh, baby. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, try it there with the tensions on fracking and natural gas. It, it, so many more of your brain cells are called into action by anything compared to anything I've ever done at a presenting a paper or something like that. So, okay, uh, but the students are key to this. The students in my class have to attend several of our series. They have to write, uh, they have to speak to a, if they can find the most agitated person in the room, speak to that person, find out what has agitated them, and then uh, write a report on that. But I also want them in the room, that having young people in that room, I think, will change the tenor of that conversation. That in many Southern American West situations, we have found that adults, uh, people over 22, behave better in the company of young people. They do not want to be as um, crabby. I guess that's the word we've been using as there would be that. So one last story about our enterprises, and then I'll um, let you go to dinner. I to allow almost no time. Well, okay, I should be able to do this fast. So we went to see warm bodies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that for two. I could, I'll just go ahead and tell you the reason. Um, I have a fair number of students in there who are not, about, why are we talking about zombies? Um, they are not particularly interested in history and they had the, I guess some of them had high school classes where you just memorized facts and so on. So I thought, I have to find a way to pull them into the subject of history and how everything that we talk about in the contemporary West makes no sense unless you're looking at the historical perspective. And so then I took what had disturbed and saddened me, the enthusiasm of teenagers for zombies, and I said to myself, we'll just have to adapt to that uh, because we know there is interest there in zombies. So for our purposes, Theodore Roosevelt is going to be a zombie who has been long dead but will not leave the earth. <laughs> His consequences, he cannot go anywhere in the West without running into the, to this legacy of Theodore Roosevelt. So I've been using zombies to refer to the people of the past who left us a legacy that we keep running into. And so going to see warm bodies made as much sense as anything else in that, um, in that environment. But it, it actually seems to be working, that people are pulled in by that. But then, the other reason we had to go see the movie, which is more compelling and more um, valuable, is that our associate dean told us to include Shakespeare in our classes, if we could. And I thought, we could do that. Because for a long time, I have been thinking about Romeo and Juliet and the utility of Romeo and Juliet for the civic engagement projects of the center. We are awash in local conflicts, um, very much like Verona, and teenagers are caught in that. I'm sure there's, in Longmont, Colorado, which is having a 
fierce fight over fracking. I'm sure that Romeo's father is there and is a supporter of natural gas development, and Juliet's mother is there, and she is a fierce opponent of frac fracking. So I have a, an assignment, the core assignment for the class this semester is for the students to pick a Western conflict and imagine out the Romeo and Juliet conflict. The historical dimension is front and center because in the play, which is very weird actually, you never know why the Capulets and the Montagues are at odds. Mm -hmm. right. There's a little, yeah. did you just forget to put that in or is there some <laughs> powerful radic reason for that? My students have to put in why the Montagues and Capulets that they select, why they are fighting. Because they also, the director of the Shakespeare Festival told us that for a century and a half, audiences in Europe could not bear happy endings. So for quite a spell, productions of Romeo and Juliet, they didn't die. The Montagues and Capulets came to their senses. Mm -hmm. and. They didn't have to die. So not every production for that century and a half, but a fair amount of the time that that went on. So they they can have a happy ending. They can have an interagency memo of understanding negotiated <laughs> between contesting federal agencies. They can do whatever they want. They can have a conflict mediator in this colder group or whatever. So that is um, working, as far as I can tell. We'll know more on February 28th when the papers come come in. But it's a, it's a first draft, second draft thing with intensive revision, so if it didn't quite come out, we'll find out about that. Um, so that is the pitch that I am making here that for, uh, I shall now make a wildly overstated and overgeneralized remark, but I'll make it anyway, which is that in a number of ways over the last 30 or 40 years, academic history retreated into specialization and cloistered communication. Overstated. Many fine practitioners left out of that, but I stand by the generalization. And we are now in a great era of change and re-engagement, and this tuning project is absolutely at center stage of that. So history, the history profession is indeed positioned to lead in that great era of change and re-engagement of the academic world with the world around it. So I close with a story, Western history, wonderful Western history story from Virginia City, uh, Nevada, during the the Comstock load rush, there was an old fellow who went into a saloon in Virginia City and uh, drank way too much and passed out, and then his pals found that to present an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I guess everything presents an opportunity, though it didn't present much of an opportunity for this man who passed out. But he, uh, they picked him up, and they decided to play a little practical joke. So the, they carried him to the Virginia City Cemetery. Uh, and they put him next to a grave that had been dug but not yet occupied. So they, and then it was not that long till dawn, so his pal was hidden in a bush, and, and then they watched to see what would happen when, they, when their pal woke up. So the sun starts to come up, and the old gentleman sits up, and he looks at the sun, and then he looks over at the open, unoccupied grave, and looks back at the sun, and he's just trying every form of data collection and interpretation he can. There he's just thinking, thinking, back to the grave, at the sun, and then he says, finally he says, I've got it, I know what's happened, it's the day of resurrection, and I am the first son of a gun out of the ground. <laughs> Thank you.